Order, order. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Vera Hobhouse, move the motion, please. Good morning, Sir Roger. Um, it's an honor to serve under your chairship. We probably all know at least one sufferer or an ex-sufferer of an eating disorder. As one of them put it to me, eating disorders are the easiest thing to get into and the hardest thing to get out of. We have come a long way in recent years, but we are nowhere near to providing lasting, successful treatments for hundreds of thousands of people. Many people are suffering alone, in silence, and without a support network. We are failing as a society to support people in their deeply personal battles. This debate, Sir Roger, is about stigma, and there are two stigmas around eating disorders. There's the stigma from outside, and there's the stigma that people who suffer feel themselves. The result is people often wait for a long time to ask for help. I'm happy to give way. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving way. Congratulate her on securing this debate on such an important issue. Does she agree with me that one of the ways to tackle that stigma is for people to speak out, first of all, and then for other people to have confidence to speak out as well? And that really will contribute to more early diagnosis and better treatment and care. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I totally agree with um, the Honourable Member. Um, we do have in the audience people um, who have spoken out, and I will come to this, how important it is that people have the confidence and feel safe to speak out. It takes, it takes people an average of 58 weeks from realising they have a problem to seeking help from a GP. This is more than a year of self-doubt, self-loathing and self-harm. On average, there's a further 27 weeks until the start of treatment. Add to that the time the person suffers with a disorder before admitting that they have a problem and we start to have the real picture. I'm happy to give way. Thank you, Honourable Lady, for giving way. Um, I just wanted to raise uh, an issue in my constituency. We have an excellent facility, Rarian Fields, run by Navigo, which is a social enterprise, uh, and it's rated as outstanding by the CQC, but it only accepts patients over the age of 17. And actually, if we're to tackle some of these very deep-rooted uh, and psychologically motivated issues, does she agree with me that actually we need to have uh, facilities for younger people under the age of 17, which are incredibly difficult to get access to around the country? I, I thank her for this contribution. I think, yes, we do not understand um, really eating disorders deeply enough in order to, to see that we need to start a lot earlier um, and having facilities for, for young people who are younger than 17 um, and get into the issue at a much earlier age. So it, it, it is all about really understanding what the problem is. And I think we are a long way behind of understanding properly. Um, where the deep-rooted um, uh, causes are. So, yes, um, you know, the more um, early treatment we can get and the earlier we can intervene, um, the better that is. On that point, would she, would she give way? Yes, I'm happy to give way. My honourable friend has been in incredibly generous with her time and I congratulate her on uh, securing this incredibly important um, debate. Inter early intervention, which she agrees, is hugely significant and that many eating disorders can be prevented from developing to their full extent with proper preventative care. Um, she may be aware um, the government enables Public Health Cumbria to spend only 75 pence per head for children in the county on preventative treatment. Would she agree that that is a disgrace? and that we instead ought to be investing in having, for instance, a mental health worker attached to every single school to ensure that we prevent people getting to this stage. Um, yes, I thank my honourable friend for this intervention. I think across the board we, we realise, particularly when it comes to public health, that prevention is so much better than picking up the pieces afterwards. Mm -hmm. so, and we can save so much money if we do something early rather than only coming in when somebody is at, already at a crisis. And that's particularly true for mental health. But again, it's, it's due to the fact that, and I will come later to that, that it is just still not very well understood. Um, okay, I give away the last time. I thank her very much for giving way. She's being very generous with her time. Um, I, I, I have a personal interest in this. Um, a close member of my family suffered from bulimia. And I think that the, the thing that we found most important in this was the support that could be provided by the family network. 
And that, above anything else that could be provided, was the thing that carried, carried this family member through to a successful conclusion. Does she agree with that? Um, I, I, I thank the Honourable Member for, for, for that intervention and I think anybody who's had a close family member will understand exactly the point that he is making. Um, that, uh, uh, but, but families are often pretty helpless too. So um, if they, they don't really understand what can be done and how um, um, they can help their family member to get out of that problem. Um, and because it is a form of addiction, um, it is a bit like any, any, any other sort of addictions where you're a co-sufferer, you really want to help, but we do not really, as family members, understand how, where the deep-seated problems are. Um, and, and so family members are very important, but really we need the professionals and the understanding from the professionals um, to help um, fa uh, families to get through that together. But I think he's absolutely right. It is, a, some, it is something that families um, can be incredibly important. Uh, I need to make some progress now. Um, uh, let me pick up where, where, where I ended. Eating disorders define large periods of people's lives, but how can we shorten this? We need people to be okay with saying, I'm not okay. We need to tackle the stigma around the eating disorders. And this message needs to get through to a lot of people. Over one million people in the UK have an eating disorder. Three quarters are women, one quarter are men. This is a very large number, plus friends and families who suffer with them. So many people with conditions like anorexia and bulimia blame themselves. It is not their fault, and we need to make sure they know it. When I announced that I was hosting this debate on Twitter, I received a wave of emotional responses and personal stories. Yesterday, a local doctor dropped in uh, a book through my office that she has written describing her fight with eating disorders since the age of 13, and uh, that echoes how early it can start. I also got an email from a young woman called Lorna, who experienced serious anorexia while studying in my constituency in Bath. This is what she told me. I ended up with an initial diagnosis of anxiety and depression and was started on antidepressant. I suspended my studies and worked as a carer in my local village, living at home with my mum and brother. People I'd known all my life began commenting on the weight I'd lost and telling me how good I looked. This is when my anorexia began to take full hold. I stopped eating completely, lying to my mum and saying I'd eaten at work, began over-exercising compulsively, and remember pacing the corridors at work to burn extra calories. I became obsessed. I weighed myself up to 12 times a day. My mum was terrified but didn't know what to do. Eventually, she came with me to my GP and I told him everything. I told him I was petrified of putting on weight, exercising excessively and skipping nearly every meal. His response was, oh, that'll be your antidepressant. He took me off a high dose, there and then, cold turkey. Each time I told him how out of control I felt with my eating, he'd force me onto the scales, shaking and crying, and then tell me my BMA was healthy and I didn't meet the criteria um, for diagnosis. I was devastated. I had opened up and was denied help. I never got diagnosed with anorexia, despite going from a size 16 to a size 8 in less than a year. I went through the monthly humiliation of being dragged onto scales and told I wasn't thin enough to be helped yet. And not having a formal diagnosis is hard. When I, people, I, was anorexic, when I tell people I was anorexic, they never quite believe me, as even doctors didn't. I think they always assume I was being dramatic or it wasn't that bad then. Today, Lorna says, I'm weight restored, although I struggle now with being overweight. It took me three years, says Lorna, to recover. Three years of misery and obsession. I was dangerously unwell, but not sick enough to get an ounce of support. I read this story and it amazes me how brave Lorna is. Firstly, brave to ask for treatment, 
and even braver to put her trust into the medical system a second time, even after she didn't receive the treatment she really needed, and very brave to tell her story. Lorna has gone on to campaign for proper treatment for eating disorder. She is in this room, and I want to personally thank her for letting me share her story. Lorna, thank you. I'm so sorry you had to go through such an awful experience. I know your words will help others, and I desperately hope that together we can improve the treatment and care of those with eating disorders and really end the stigma for good. But firstly, we can't ignore the medical feelings, uh, failings in Lorna's story. We need to use these and the figures that prove that Lorna's experience are isolated. Firstly, we need to break the stereotype that all people with eating disorders are underweight. Hope Virgo's campaign to dump the scales, too, was a response to being told that she wasn't thin enough for support. She's calling on the government to properly implement the eating disorder guidance delivered by clinicians, a call which I strongly echo along with over 60,000 signatories to her petition. To judge an eating disorder simply by BMI is not good enough. Rather, we need to look at the trend and rapidity of weight loss and the story that sufferers tell. We know the Department for Health and Social Care know this is an issue. We know that if we fail to take action, then people not only suffer, but in some cases lose their lives. When questioned on, when questioned on waiting times, the minister often says that the government do have targets, but ignores or doesn't tell us that there are only that there are none for adult services. On average, adults' waits are twice as, long, tw twice as long as people under the age of 19. The government must do everything to remove barriers to treatment. And in particular, young adults are incredibly vulnerable. At our autumn conference, the Lib Dems called for the government to ensure all young people can access children and, men uh, and young people's mental health he uh, services for up to the age of 25. Because many young adults at, the age, at this age, when they're just um, um, over 18, are moving out, going to further education, or starting their first job. All of this can be stressful at a time when there's no longer the, the support from home. We also must introduce waiting times for adults to ensure that they receive help as quickly as possible. The minister is also likely to mention that in 2015, the government allocated 30 million pounds extra resource per year for five years to improve the NHS treatment of eating disorders for teenagers. However, in some cases, this is not reaching the front line. The funding is not ring-fenced and can be diverted to other priorities. Would she give way on that I'm happy point? to give way. Very, my, my honourable friend is being very, very generous. Um, Maybe just leading on from the point that she uh, just raised, she would be aware that uh, in 2016 the government pledged money for a specific one-to-one -one eating disorder service for children and young people, people under the age of 18, and yet two and a half years on in Cumbria that service does not exist, and those people who present with eating disorders often go through the struggles that my honourable friend has just talked about because the people they see are not specialists. Um, I... Thank you for, for this intervention. I will come to this, um, and that is also the lack of proper training, um, because uh, that's really at the bottom of, of what he's describing, but I'm happy to give way as well. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady and, and um, congratulate her on having given us the opportunity to discuss this very serious issue. Would she agree with me that in addition to dealing with the problems thrown up by having an dis eating disorder, the, the problem then starts for families and those in that position of trying to access proper services and it is varies from place to place, town to town, city to city and doesn't she believe we need a more integrated service that is the same everywhere and provides an effective service for young people and older people for that matter in this situation? I, um, I fully agree with the Honourable Member that because the services are too patchy. And that is then why families don't really know what to do. Um, so we need to, first of all, make sure that, that, that there isn't a postcode lottery, but I will come to that for, um, later on. Um, but also that services follow on from each other and are much more holistic and integrated. Um, there's a lot to do. 
Um, so funding, uh, funding for eating disorders must be properly ring-fenced. That was the point um, that, that, that I was making, making before. It's just too easy for trust to, to use this money if it's not ring-fenced, to use it to, to, to um, plug other funding gaps. Because if we don't, we end up with, um, with a tragic death like that of Avril Hart, which prompted a Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman report, because she was completely failed by the system. That report not only called for parity of adult eating disorder services with child and adolescent services, but also stated, and here um, uh, comes what um, has already been mentioned, that the General Medical Council should conduct a review of training for all junior doctors on eating disorders. Research conducted by Dr. Agnes Aiton dated um, June 2018 shows that on average, medical students receive less than two hours of teaching on eating disorders throughout the entirety of their undergraduate training. 20% of medical schools do not include eating disorders in their curriculum at all. Of the medical schools that do include eating disorders in their curriculum, 50% do not include eating disorders in their examination. In the end, it comes down to the priority that we and the medical profession place on mental health and its treatment. Making mental health a priority and putting it on a parity with physical health is more than a slogan. It requires understanding and some new thinking. If, for example, somebody breaks their arm, we don't sit around for a year and then put on a cast. We treat the broken arm immediately. We need to act quickly to treat eating disorders and mental health in general. If we wait too long, these illnesses can become severe and entrenched lasting for many years and often have a massively debilitating effect on the sufferers as well as their families. The earlier the intervention, the more likely sufferers will make a full recovery. In Bath, we have a not-for-profit social enterprise called Brighter Futures, funded by CUMS, which provides special services for children and young people. The 30-plus practitioners do an amazing job, but their funding has now been cut in half. Services like this are a perfect opportunity for early intervention to treat eating disorders. But if they aren't properly funded, young people will slip through the cracks. Charities are now trying to fill the gap. Somerset and Wessex Eating Disorders Association is such a charity. They are the only charity working in this field between Cornwall and Norfolk. They are based in Shepton Mallet and see clients from a wide area, from Somerset and Bath, Bristol to Swindon. People self self-refer to the service, they do not need a diagnosis, they are very much pro-recovery and self-help. But there are people all over the country who don't have access to services like this at all. There should not be a difference in the level of service you receive based on where you live. We cannot leave this to a postcode lottery. Clearly, we need to do better. It is obvious that services are patchy at best and that people are having to travel far too far for treatment and wait too long to be treated. And there are also those who really need help but falling under the threshold of treatment. It is not just the government who should act to tackle eating disorders. The focus on this debate today is on stigma and how we can reduce it. Each and every one of us can help. Eating disorders are widespread but they continue to be kept secret by so many sufferers. They fear being judged negatively by others. They see themselves as defective and not meeting societal standards. They feel disgust and self-loathing about their appearance, eating or purging habits. Or they worry that disclosure will result in trivializing their difficulties. And the stigma is perpetuated by general ignorance of what eating disorders actually are. The first step to challenging stigma is for better education. Not only do our future doctors and health professionals need to be better trained, but so does the general public. A successful strategy to reduce prejudice is when people come forward and tell their stories. Such stories break the silence and the shame. This is why we so desperately need people like Lorna and Hope. They are brave enough to come forward. Thank you for being here and telling your story. Together, we can even end the stigma. Thank you. Yeah. The question is that this House has considered reducing stigma around eating disorders. Uh, Kirsten Hare. 
Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Anyone who has been directly affected by any form of eating disorder or been around a relation, a colleague or a friend who has had to battle this disease will be in no doubt about the devastation that battling an eating disorder can bring to a person's life. With sufferers of eating disorders having the highest mortality rate of those with any mental health condition, with around 1.25 million people in the UK suffering from an eating disorder, this is something I strongly feel has to be addressed head-on with strong actions over warm words. Furthermore, while I acknowledge that such a disorder can affect anyone, it would be inappropriate not to at least acknowledge in this era, era that emphasises the importance of having a positive body image that the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence estimates around 90% of those with eating disorders are female. To this end, I welcome the $1.4 billion that this government has committed to tackle mental health and eating disorders over the next five years, on top of the $150 million committed in 2014. But while funding for this issue is important, treatment strategy is even more so. We cannot just throw money at an issue and hope it makes the improvements we need. Hope is not a strategy. And it is in this regard that this government has made important commitments, such as the target to ensure by 2020 that 95% of those referred with an eating disorder will begin treatment within one month and within one week for cases that are diagnosed as urgent. The benefit of early treatment can never be underestimated. It is precisely such an emphasis on early treatment that is required to tackle this issue. And it's reassuring the government clearly recognises this. And I want to see anyone who needs help with an eating disorder receive that help and receive it fast. Someone close to me visited her doctor during distressing, uh, due to distressing thoughts around ending her own life. Her eating disorder had taken over. It had gone so far she believed it to be irreversible. She cried in the doctor's surgery with the pain that it caused to herself and everyone around her. She was offered antidepressants. And that's why I welcome Beat's recommendation to the Scottish Government that GPs need to be informed of the early symptoms so they are able to refer without delay. We are far too quick to offer patients a prescription rather than prescribe the help that they actually need for such a deep-rooted issue. It's therefore incredibly troubling to see such a different picture north of the border in Scotland than we have down here in England. When the SNP-led government failed to show the same urgency in dealing with this problem. Now, let me make this clear. I am not here to score political points. I am here to stand up for that gaping hole that I, my constituents and many pressure groups so clearly see in Scotland and will use this opportunity to put further pressure on the Scottish Government to right this wrong. While England has the population ten times that of Scotland, it has only four times as many hospital emissions for eating disorders. While this may partly be down to just differences in how so, such admissions are recorded, we cannot ignore the possibility that cultural or dietary differences mean that eating disorders are simply more frequent north of the border. Indeed, while the increase in eating disorders is a UK-wide phenomenon, in Scotland we have seen an increase of two-thirds since 2005 compared to just 44% here in England. But despite the apparent prevalence of eating disorders in Scotland, the government is failing to act. Most worryingly, with no reasoning behind it, Scotland has no specific waiting time targets for those diagnosed with eating disorders. With patients being subject to the same 18-week target as those with any other mental health condition, such a time frame is simply not good enough. It shows a complete failure to understand just how urgently illnesses need to be treated. 18 weeks. 126 days, that's not acceptable. That could be the difference between life and death. I wrote to the Scottish Government earlier this year to see if I could press them on this matter and whether they had any plans to introduce waiting time targets in line with those that this UK Government has outlined. The response confirmed exactly what I thought. Disappointing, although not surprising. They had no such plans. Whilst there have been freedom of information requests by various groups put to the Scottish Government to get a true image of the position, but due to the lack of national framework, they are not collated in a consistent way. 
why would the government not implement a system that allowed this information to be readily available to ensure easier data collection to work to solutions? People with this debilitating disease expect more from their government. And that's why I'm supportive of the work that Beat and other charities who are doing great campaigning to stop that weight in Scotland and recognise that an eating disorder is not something that should be categorised and treated as though it were the same as any other mental health disorder. Going back to my earlier anecdote around the doctor's surgery, I'm going to turn briefly to training. Recent research has shown that teaching and training in Scotland is, to put it politely, falling short. Look at four excellent universities in Scotland. Aberdeen, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee. When asked on average how much time is dedicated to eating disorder training during their four-year medical degree, the answer was given in hours. Aberdeen three, Dundee three, Edinburgh four, Glasgow four. Asked if eating disorders were covered in the final submissions in each written answer, and the answer was one question in the Dundee exam and zero for the other three. I'm not a doctor, but I know that's not enough. When patients come in around an eating disorder or any other similar issue, our specialists must have the tools to be alert to this. We know those with eating disorders have this innate ability to portray that the issues related to their lack of food are in fact nothing to do with it. I know because I have witnessed this firsthand with people around me. Self-referral, another area where we could try and bring in those to get help that need it. Now, we all know those with eating disorders would need a significant amount of support to determine they need help, but when they do, they should be welcomed in and nurtured by our system. Two-thirds of NHS trusts in England are accepting self-referral for children and young people. However, when we turn to Scotland, only Dumfries and Galloway CAMS accepts self-referral self -referral for children and young people who are suspected with an eating disorder. I know you're all thinking the same as me. Why? It's only through an approach that recognises eating disorder diagnosis requires urgent action, resulting in specialist treatment, that we can truly make progress on this issue. The Scottish Government must act sooner rather than later. I will continue to campaign and put pressure to get improvements we need for my constituents and all those that are suffering in Scotland. The Scottish Government must stop burying their head in the sand and give this the dedicated attention it needs. We need to help those affected out of the position they have found themselves in so they can begin to rebuild their lives and the lives of those around them. Roger, first of all, can I congratulate the Honourable Lady for, uh, for Bath for bringing this forward and for her uh, truly compassionate way that you brought the, the matter to the, to the floor of the Westminster Hall for consideration. It, it, it's well seen that, that, that uh, the Honourable Lady is, is one who cares, and thank you for that. Um, this is a subject matter that, that personally I've been involved with uh, with some of my constituents. Uh, I'm going to give two examples, uh, uh, Sir Roger. Um, w one was not successful and one was, uh, and, and, and I use those in very, very loose terms. And my party is a uh, uh, health spokesperson here, and um, because I've had a direct um, in involvement in these two cases and, and, and knowledge of them, I, I just wanted to perhaps maybe just comment upon them. It's estimated that some 360 adults and 190 children in Northern Ireland are referred to specialist community ED services each year for eating disorders. Um, and the, the figures in the, in the, in the background uh, that we have uh, are, are, are truly uh, monumental and, and horrendous. But they do give a, a, an indication of the, of the, uh, uh, the um, health problems that they, they have. I think some of the figures in the last five years according to, have, have increased to say an increase of some 92 per cent. Again, that gives an indication that perhaps this is something that maybe we need to focus on through the health department. We look to the minister, as we always do, uh, for, for uh, um, a suitable response that will give us some heart. Mm -hmm. give way? Yeah, absolutely. I thank the member for uh, giving way. Uh, would he agree with me that the startling increase that we've seen in the past five to, to ten years would indicate that we need even more research done regarding the underlying reasons to try and assess the problems rather than taking a superficial answer, making a superficial answer to this issue? Yeah, my, my, I thank my honourable uh, friend and colleague, Faris Lundari, for bringing that, for that intervention. He's absolutely right. We, we do need to raise the awareness. I think this debate today does that. We also need to uh, raise awareness within some of the health services so that they can perhaps uh, diagnose it earlier <coughs> and, and, and the right diagnosis for what, what it is as well. 
But, and, and, but I want to give the, the examples of a can. So, Roger, um, I was um, uh, distraught uh, to learn during the research from this debate that a young lady from Ballon Hinch, uh, her family from Kelly Day within my constituency, lost her fight with her eating disorder and died at the age of 21 from a heart attack in March of this year after struggling with an eating disorder since 2009. It is quite horrendous, uh, and I'm going to give quick, very quickly the mum's uh, um, interpretation of that. I read the article that her mother wrote with the Belfast Telegraph, which outlined the problem we have with treatment in Northern Ireland. I know that's not the Minister's responsibility, uh, but I just want to indicate that if there's problems in the mainland, uh, certainly we have, the, we have similar problems. Uh, and and, and what, what's happening in, in Northern Ireland, and Scotland, and Wales, and England are, are, are replicated wherever you are. I don't think it really matters very much, uh, to, to, be, to be fair. Um, I, I read the article that her mother uh, uh, put in the Belfast Telegraph, which outlined the problem we have. Uh, beautiful Sophie Bridges was 14 when she was referred to the NHS Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service. Uh, and, and the words of, of her mother are clear. Absolutely pathetic, said Mrs. Bridges. It's no reflection on anybody who works there. They try their best, but she was discharged on her 16th birthday. She was no better. She was just above the age for the service. She was still too young, though, for the adult service and had nowhere to go. And that's one of the problems we have. Uh, going from children to adulthood, and it seems to be us, and, and, and my two examples will, will illustrate that very, very clearly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dale. I'm sorry for being late uh, into the debate. Would the Honourable Member agree with me that while we talk about early intervention, he's talking about young people, there is a responsibility with schools and also through social media where that can be so cruel on young people who feel that they're not perfect and they're forced to go down that direction. More needs to be done in that direction as well. Yeah, I think my friend uh, for, for that intervention is absolutely right. Uh, social media has a lot to answer for. It has a lot to answer for in lots of things, but certainly in this one it has as well. Um, Mrs Bridges says uh, um, uh, we, we just had to deal with it at home. We felt there was only a focus on her physical health. There was absolutely no psychological service. Uh, and, and, and sometimes we, we need to get the, the early diagnosis to ensure that we can move, move to the the physical, yes, but also move to the psychological, because that's so important and, and it's a key, key factor in this. Sophie spent the first half of 2017 uh, as a hospital patient in a mental health unit. Uh, they did their best, but the provision just isn't there. There are just so many different issues in one unit. There are girls like Sophie in the same ward as elderly people with dementia and others with schizophrenia. So right away, you can understand where the problems are. And I don't think those problems are unique to Northern Ireland, Sir Roger. I think they're replicated across the whole of the United Kingdom. It is clear that we are letting people down who need the help and attention that could make them a life-saving difference from them. That's one young girl who tragically, very tragically, uh, lost her life, and we, we, we uh, very much think of the family and the parents in particular. I can also give an example, Sir Roger, of one of my other constituents who um, and I knew her mum and dad uh, quite well. Her father, mother and father were both in the police. Uh, I knew him as, as a councillor and a member of the assembly long before he came to this place in 2010. Um, but they, they had a daughter, I'm not going to mention her name, and, and, and she had uh, anorexia as well. It was so extreme, uh, Sir Roger, that, that, that uh, I was telling uh, my colleague to the left hand side here, I actually had spoken to the then health minister in Northern Ireland, Edwin Putz, uh, and, and explained the case to, to him. Now, uh, and, and we, we don't have self referrals. Uh, as the Honourable Lady referred to, they have to be referred from the Health Department. But I had asked uh, uh, Evan would he look at this case, because this lady, the young girl, was very, very close, honestly, to death. Um, so so they ref he referred her across <coughs> to here. And I met her and her parents in, in the house here back in 2010 or 2011, I think it was. And she attended the hospital just across the way, St Thomas's, uh, and they were able to help her. And, and they, Sir, Sir Roger, the fact of the matter is, uh, the treatment that she got, and, and let's give the NHS some credit as well for what they do do. Uh, they saved her life uh, and, 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 and turned around, and she's now married and with two children. So, so for her and for uh, her parents and her family, uh, good news. The fact is that despite uh, uh, our best efforts in addressing nutrition in classrooms, as my honourable friend for, uh, for Robert Bannon referred to, and through soaps and other programmes, Eating Disorder Association NI has said that eating disorders are most commonly seen in young people under 18 years of age are becoming more common in children between the ages of 8 and 14. So let's not underestimate uh, just how early this can start and how it affects people. And I think the Honourable Lady referred to that in her introduction as well. Eating disorders in, in children are becoming more common. And within this age group, 
Uh, research shows that boys are uh, at a high risk as girls, and some of the figures indicate that, and I'll, I'll speak to them in a wee minute. The society that we live in, uh, uh, what is perhaps a misguided approach to promoting healthy living, also fixates on skinny living. Um, and I'm a guy that was one, one, stage, one stage was 18 stone, uh, or just sorry, almost 18 stone, uh, and, and, and I was a, a fastly approaching diabetes, which I, that, which I then turned round by, 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 by reducing my weight, which I've done, and, and hopefully keep that off as well. But, but these, are, these are different. I did that because there was a purpose to be achieved, and, and, and did that and stopped. Uh, what we're talking about is people who can't. Comments in such programmes, as an example. Keeping up with the Kardashians, I have to say that I don't watch it, uh, and, and I can tell you who they are, where they're from, or anything about them. I'll tell you what, my parliamentary aide, um, uh, she won't mind me saying it, much to her shame, watches it. Um, uh, we're in fixation on, on, on looking skinny, and even in one clip being called anorexic as a compliment must be addressed. Now, in fairness, the apology from the Kardashians is wonderful, and they are to be commended for realising that these com comments came across in a non healthy way. But the fact is that the words said cannot be withdrawn, and young women wanting to be more like the Kardashians, who seem to have it all, are impacted. So we cannot have censorship, and I'm not saying we should have that, Sir Roger, but I'm saying this. We must have common sense to address and not worsen uh, our eating disorder problems. Uh, my honourable friend for, for Lagan uh, Valley referred to social media. It's a lot to answer for. Uh, it, it, it does set a trend, peer pressure. Sometimes I wonder, uh, some of the problems we have in society are, are, are they, I'm not blaming for everything, but they, they're certainly down to them. And, 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 and also, I'll just refer to, to the background information, because many of us are, are referring to, to raising awareness, but also the Health Service Ombudsman have also recommended measures to increase awareness of eating disorders uh, among health care staff, because they've got to know what, they, what the telltale signs are. Uh, and to support early diagnosis. And I think if we can, we can move that, maybe the Minister in his response will give us an indication uh, of what he can do there. I, I look at my own, uh, Sir Roger, my own uh, beautiful granddaughters, and I sincerely believe that they are perfect. The thought of, the, of that view uh, of themselves being shaped by others is frightening. They're only young girls, only nine and four, but, but at that age of eight, for some uh, eight-year-olds, is already starting to take place. So let's address this issue at, at the very earliest um, Potential. I believe we must take steps to ensure that there is a difference between skinny and healthy. And it must start from a young age. Uh, the, the background figures again give us an indication of, of the magnitude of, of, of eating disorders. 725,000 people with eating disorders. Uh, the figures at that time said that 90 per cent of those were female, but the latest figures indicate that some 25 per cent of that figure, that rising figure, uh, are probably male. So, so uh, while it is very much um, an issue with, with young girls, and that's the ones that I would know through, through my constituents. I think we also have to recognise that there are young men out there who have the same, same problems. So, uh, and, and, and that young men are becoming as likely as young women uh, to suffer from an eating disorder. We must ensure that message is sent. That this is not a teenage girl issue. It is men, it is women, it is old and young, it is rich and poor, and it is life threatening. And we must do more to address it, and importantly, more to provide help to beat it and keep beating it every day for all of their lives. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Lady for Bath for securing this uh, important debate. And she began rightly by saying that eating disorders are about so much more than stigma. Um, and I think it is right that we focus on treatment because eating disorders, as I think all of us in this room know, are the conditions that are very often dismissed initially as all too often girls trying to look like celebrities and often end with a third of people recovering but with a third of people living with them for the rest of their lives and a third of people not making it at all and those figures are truly shocking and would be shocking for any condition whether it were mental or physical health but the stigma that arises from, uh, from eating disorders is not solely around looking slim. It is around the pervasive effect of that eating disorder. It is about a condition that very quickly stops people being able to function in the way that they would wish to function. It is about conditions that stop people leaving the house. It is about people ending up being stigmatized because they are not behaving in the way that they would like to and they are not able to fulfill a function within society. They are often not able even to work or to go out. So the stigma 
arises because of the condition, and it is the condition that clearly we should be focusing on. And I want to say just a couple of things. The first is to commend uh, the work that charities such as BEAT uh, have done um, to raise awareness of these conditions and to try and make sure that they are not stigmatised, that GPs in particular do not greet uh, people who show up suggesting that they are worried about their own attitudes to food and say that it's not a problem and that they might just allow themselves to go away and get better. We do need to focus on the training for our NHS, but we do also need to acknowledge, as my uh, honourable friend from Angus has done, that there has been some progress in England, if not sufficient, uh, in Scotland yet uh, at this stage. But this is not a party political matter. And I think uh, while we have, uh, as, uh, as I've said, seen some very positive work both from the NHS and from charities, um, we have, uh, as the uh, Honourable Member for Strangford said, seen some very damaging effects of, of social media. And social media has a huge opportunity to promote the positive body image that we would all like to see um, around uh, the uh, future of uh, technology and around the future of what uh, being healthy in the 21st century looks like. But the reality is at this stage, social media does, I think, on this front, far more harm than good. It is far too easy to uh, look, uh, to scratch the surface of the internet and find images that reinforce uh, deeply negative uh, perceptions of body image and that reinforce behaviours that are profoundly harmful. And I think it is a reasonable question to ask if social media companies can do huge amounts to take down child abuse images to take down uh, images that we as a society decide are profoundly harmful, what more could be done to automatically or more rapidly take down images that all too often end up in people losing or taking their own lives? So there is, I give away. I, I, I thank him for giving, giving away on that point, and he makes a very powerful point about social media. But I wonder whether he, he needs to go one stage further than this and look at the role of the advertising industry behind this and the images that they uh, put forward that are encouraging uh, young people to achieve a, a, a fantasy position for themselves and their body image. Uh, I, I absolutely, thank you, I, I absolutely uh, agree with my honourable friend, and, and it, it is in fact the point that I was uh, coming on to make next, which is to say that while there are clearly uh, sites that are encouraging profoundly uh, self-harming behaviour, there is also exactly the more pervasive image that uh, he has uh, referred to often in the advertising industry. And I think it is tackling that in a sensible way that both promotes a genuinely healthy lifestyle without promoting unhealthy or unreasonable expectations that we should look uh, to uh, regulators and to government for uh, action on. But this is, we should not pretend a di uh, anything other than a very difficult area because tackling those issues uh, should not uh, bleed over into uh, not being positive about people who struggle with their weight uh, and who often uh, would like to see a more positive image of people who are also larger. So I don't think any of us want to see an advertising regulator uh, that would uh, w would end up sort of prescribing an ideal weight, but I think we do need to prescribe a greater sense of health. Uh, the second thing that I would uh, like to say is to uh, absolutely agree with the Honourable Lady's point that uh, no uh, sensible uh, and properly trained doctor in the modern uh, NHS is using solely BMI uh, to, uh, to uh, assess whether uh, as a patient has an eating disorder, but too often uh, it does become the single defining characteristic and too many of those doctors uh, have not uh, been provided with all of the tools and do not have the services into which they might refer. So often BMI does become the measurement of last resort and it is right that the NHS is seeking to tackle that and it is right that we try and in this house do all we can to encourage uh, the minister and uh, the NHS itself. Um, and the final thing uh, that I would like to say is about family therapy, which uh, the Honourable Lady mentioned. Uh, it's my understanding that family therapy, particularly for young people and for adolescents, is the only clinically proven uh, therapy that, make, that has been shown to make a real difference. It is 
uh, incredibly intensive. It is incredibly intensive in terms of resources and in terms of the pressure on the family and on the patient, but it works. And I think we should be doing more to try and reduce, to come back to the beginning of the debate, the stigma around families accepting that they may have someone in their midst who needs help, not just from the NHS, but from their own uh, families and from their own friends. But it remains the case, as uh, the Honourable Lady said, that eating disorders do not stop when you are 17 or 18. Of course, in all too many cases, triggered by stress, they can emerge or return um, when a patient gets older. And it is with that in mind that I think we should commend the work of places like the Maudsley that have tried to see what they can do to push family therapy beyond the point where everyone is reasonably expected to live at home and say maybe the university setting can be a kind of family that encourages people to get better. But what happens when people are older? Because, of course, there are, as I, as I said at the beginning of my speech, a number of uh, entirely functioning uh, older adults who need all the help that we can possibly provide them and it is about more than antidepressants and I think if the government could do two things the first uh, I would suggest would be to encourage social media companies to look more closely at what can be done to tackle those images that go beyond the kind of advertising that my honourable friend has said we do need to look at but uh, do go way into a territory which is not healthy for anyone to be seeking out or to be finding. But my second ask would be when it comes to funding research, when it comes to spending some of that £1.4 billion that we are uh, allocating to eating disorders over the coming years, then it is the extension of family therapy, it is the extension of the one method we know works that we should be seeing if, uh, with the help of science and innovation, we can look to go further because while the stigma around this issue is a hugely important one, it is tackling the illness itself that we must focus on. Um, uh, to serve on your uh, chairship. Uh, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Bath in securing this very important debate. It's a sad reflection uh, of our times that the explosion of social media in the last decade has spawned an obsession with looking good and showing off your body. If you want to be in the right, with the right crowd, you need to post images of yourself looking happy with your beautiful body. Sadly, sometimes the impression given on social media does not match the reality, and there have been reported cases where people have not been able to keep up with the facade of being permanently happy and striving for the perfect body, and this has resulted in their suicide. Eating disorders are part and parcel of this obsession with body image, with has hashtags such as Thinspiration, showing images of many young people showing off their thin bodies and limbs. Unfortunately, the way social media works nowadays, by clicking on the internet links and being thin or having a beautiful body, thanks to the algorithms that are part and parcel of social media, you will more than likely receive online advertisements about dieting and weight loss. One thing that is desperately needed is greater understanding about the mental health aspect of eating disorders and the addictive nature of many of the conditions, including body dysmorphia. I have a constituent who has been struggling with anorexia for a number of years. He had difficulties in living on his own, and for living on his own, and for his own well-being, had to move back home with his parents for the support that they were able to give him. He desperately needed mental health services from the local CCG, and although it was a battle, we were successful in getting him the help that he needed. Uh, eating disorders are serious mental illnesses that can have severe psychological, physical and social consequences. They typically involve disordered eating behaviour, which might mean restricting food intake, binge eating, purging, fasting or excessive exercise or a combination of these behaviours. I was recently made aware of orthorexia, which is an obsession or addiction to eating healthy food, which is a gateway to other eating disorders. Many of the eating disorders are associated with negative perceptions of body image. As I mentioned previously, uh, a negative perception of body image coupled with the obsession of posting pictures on social media exacerbates the problem, leading to more stress and pushing those suffering closer to the edge. In the clinical guidelines uh, on eating disorders, 
the National Institute of Care Excellence state that emotional and physical consequences of those beliefs and behaviours maintain the disorder and result in high mortality rates from malnutrition, suicide and physical issues such as electrolyte imbalances, osteoporosis and anxiety disorders. Using figures for the UK hospital admissions from 2012 to 2013, the Eating Disorders Charity, BEAT, estimated that there were uh, 725,000 people with an eating disorder in the UK, approximately 90% of which were female. With each disorder, there is a close association with poor quality of life, social isolation, and a substantial impact for family members and carers. Eating disorders are long-lasting conditions, if not treated. In an article in The Guardian from October of last year, Dave Chawner describes his experience as a boy with an eating disorder. In this article, he says, Before I was anorexic, I'd always assumed people with mental illnesses knew they weren't well. But on reflection, that's ridiculous. My dad has diabetes. He had it for years before anyone realised, and no one expected him to innately know. Sometimes you're too close to your own life to gain perspective. It's like trying to make sense of a painting if you're only inches away from it. He goes on, it's really hard to find words to describe my anorexia. It was more of a feeling, a lacking, an awareness I wasn't really coping. And I wanted to talk, but I didn't know what to say. I was waiting for something to happen so I could classify myself as ill. I was worried people wouldn't take me seriously, that if I didn't explain myself properly, people would think I was attention-seeking or pathetic. He finishes by saying, so I understand why more people don't just talk, because sometimes finding the words can seem impossible. Not all the silence on mental illness is to do with stigma. It's also about finding the right words. We have to get rid of the stigma around eating disorders to help people like Dave and, and thousands of others who are suffering. We know that there are thousands of people with eating disorders who are being turned away from treatment and support every day, and also that NICE guidelines for access to treatment are correct but are not being implemented in the right way. Well, my, I'll give I really appreciate my humble friend giving way. This is a, a real issue with Vale of York CCG, which only 12.9% of people start treatment within four weeks. And of the £161,000 that's had to spend on this, has only spent £68,000. B to identify the Vale of York CCG is the worst in the country. So um, does my honourable friend agree that there needs to be far more robust accountability around delivering of services for eating disorders? Uh, my old friend makes an excellent point, and yes, uh, as I'll come to in a short while, uh, I, I believe that much more funding and accountability is, ne is needed to tackle eating disorders. A person's BMI should not prevent people from getting the support they need. Action is also needed to tackle irresponsible social media companies which allow platforms to those who glorify eating disorders and negative body images. Failure to tackle action uh, on eating disorders is costing lives and results in heartbreak, anguish and despair for people with eating disorders and their families and ends up costing the NHS more due to increased need when someone hits crisis. Much more funding is needed for mental health services including CAMS. More early intervention is needed to address eating disorders. Eating disorders are serious, potentially life-threatening conditions and unless proper support is given, more mental health funding is made available to tackle these disorders, we will all pay the price in the future. Chris Evans, you have enough time. Thank you, Sir Roger. Thank you for calling me to this debate. And I'd like to begin by congratulating the Honourable Lady for Bath for bringing this vital debate to the House. I'd also like to pay tribute to all those people who are watching us today, whether in the House of Commons or they're at home. I know that this, these conditions, eating disorders, wherever they are, whether bulimia nervosa or anorexia nervosa, body dysmorphia or others, is a very secretive and a very private illness that people are battling. And it's very difficult for them to speak out because of fear of being judged. And I have to say, the pressure that people are under, that many members have touched on today, to look thin, to look healthy, to look muscular, is immense. When I was a teenager, my big role models were Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. Every time their films come out, I wanted to look like them. It ended to the point that I was working out twice a day. I was lifting weights constantly. I was following a diet. I was suffering from all the, all the causes of body dysmorphia. I, was never, I never looked good enough. 
But at the same time, that wasn't the trigger just by wanting to look like Big Arnie. The trigger was my parents were going through a divorce. It was a high-stress situation. I was about to sit my exams. And the only way out of it was to look, to look like Schwarzenegger Stallone. Luckily or unluckily for me, I resulted in an injury on my arms and I couldn't lift weights anymore and it sort of went away. But it doesn't go away for so many people. And I am frustrated, Sir Roger, when I walk down the street and as I was coming to this debate today, I went to the news agents and I looked on all the magazine and on there, the Men's Health, this week. Lose belly fat in 30 days. GQ, pictures of, of people with uh, six packs. Gary Barlow promoting a new book. Oh, I was so unhappy when I was 17 stone. And look at me now, I'm 10, 12 stone, losing five stone. It seems the pressure and people are under is absolutely immense. And to me, even most recently, Mark Wahlberg, the late of Marky Mark and other films, uh, produces a daily regime which begins with him getting up at half past two in the morning, Sir Roger, working out two, twice, tw twice a day before half past seven when he plays golf, going off to do work. Nobody in the media condemned him. Everybody complimented him on how disciplined he was. That, to me, is madness. And what images are we sending out? Are we sending out to our young people that it's good to look like somebody does in Love Island? Well, when I'm on the beach in Porthcawl, nobody looked at Love Island then. But I think... And even this weekend, what was interesting, me and my wife decided to clear out some, some old books. And most of the books we cleaned out was Atkins, 30 Days to the New You, Body for Life, 12 Weeks to Your New Body, and even the Durkin Diet. All of these diets selling a perfect way of life. And if you were suffering, Sir Roger, like I was many years ago, of self-esteem issues, if, I th if you think you are not good enough, then these books feed exactly into that. So it's not just social media that we have to break down on. And I've got to say this about social media. We see it again, X Factor. A young girl in the paper uh, has got through, to the final from, got through to the final, said she's been plagued by trolls about her size. Well, like somebody who said earlier in the debate, if we take things down, if we force social media to take things down that are illegal, then we should do the same thing there. But I think the government can go further when it comes to the diet industry. The Advertising Standards Agency needs real teeth that when it sees these things happening, it comes down on these magazines and these advertisements like a ton of bricks. Equally, we bring about health warnings for things like cigarettes, for alcohol, then we should do exactly the same when it comes to eating disorders as well. But it seems to me we often talk about when somebody has an eating disorder. Eating disorders manifest themselves in different ways. With me, it was... It was body dysmorphia and my, my, my desire to constantly train. For others, there are other things. Like, I want to use this little anecdote. When I was a child, I was about 10 or 11, there was a young woman living at the top of our street. She was extremely, extremely skinny, and my mother said that she had anorexia. And she spoke to her one day, she befriended her, and she said to her, she said every morning she'd wake up and she'd eat a quart of a red pepper. And my mother said, well, why do you eat the red pepper? And she said, because when that comes up, I know I'm empty. But she couldn't get the help she required. She couldn't get a referral to a psychiatrist. Now, it's all well saying that was 30 years ago, but it's still happening. The National Audit Office reported the other day, a quarter of young people, which most people are affected by eating disorders, cannot get an appointment with a psychiatrist. And when they do get that appointment, it's not a specialist one. It's patchy across the country. And so, I know my time is running short here, Roger, but I will say this. I want to pay tribute, and as I began by paying tribute, all those people who, who come forward with an eating disorder, and all those people who are suffering. I'll say this now. Talk to someone. Seek out the help you need. It doesn't have to be a professional. It just has to be someone you trust. And if you come forward, you'll find that people won't judge you. They will try and help you if they can. Thank you, Sir Roger. Dr. Lisa Cameron. Many thanks. It's an absolute pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Roger, today and in what is such an extremely important debate. 
Uh, it's reaching out to those across the United Kingdom who are struggling with eating disorders and their families. And I very much commend the Honourable Member for Bath for bringing the debate to the House today and for her extremely poignant and sensitive speech around about the issues that people face day to day who are living with eating disorders and the difficulties that they have in accessing services right across the United Kingdom and also in her constituency specifically. I want to put on the record that I have worked myself as a psychologist in the NHS through my career in Scotland and that included working with people who have eating disorders and I want to spend just a few minutes of my time uh, discussing the issues that I had in terms of working with people and how I think services can be taken forward. I want to firstly though thank all of the honourable members who have uh, spoken. Uh, the honourable member for Sanford who spoke about the issues uh, in Northern Ireland and how uh, difficult it can be for people to come forward and to seek treatment and as always who spoke in a, a very consensual manner across uh, the House. Uh, I want to uh, also thank the Honourable Lady uh, from Angus who spoke about her difficulties in accessing treatment in her locality and to say to her that uh, that is a, a difficulty indeed. Um, and I think it's one that's reflective of the service difficulties we do have across the United Kingdom. But I'd like to sit down with her and discuss it uh, with her in terms of my own experience, if she would be willing to do that. Uh, the Scottish Government have put in money to uh, mental health services, including eating disorder services. There is an extra £250 million for mental health that has been placed at the heart of the strategy. The Scottish Government's mental health strategy is a long-term strategy from 2017 to 2027. The other issues that I wanted to discuss today um, are those issues that have been raised by honourable members. Uh, those about body image, I think, are extremely important. I think body image has come to the fore, really, with the advent of social media. And it's something that people struggle with, that particularly young people are struggling with, and that I would think is uh, contributing much more so to the difficulties that people are facing and possibly a greater propensity of eating disorders are developing as a result of those issues. Uh, so I would particularly like to thank the Honourable Member for Is Iswillen, if I said... <laughs> thank you for that correction. Uh, for raising the issue about body image, particularly um, for young men, because I think that's often overlooked, but I think it's extremely important and will become much more important and relevant uh, as time goes on, because social media has such an impact upon people, as do advertisers, and it's certainly contributing to the difficulties that people experience with a sense of perfectionism. And uh, young men are not excluded from that. In fact, uh, we can see the very idealistic um, images that are portrayed both for young men and for young women, which I would say are particularly unhealthy to development, both psychologically and physically, uh, in relation to uh, people's adjustment and mental health in particular. Uh, the Honourable Member for Enfield Southgate uh, also spoke about body image and social media and the difficulties of accessing treatment. Um, and services in his constituency and I'd like to thank him again. Uh, he often makes uh, fantastic contributions and I'm always so very pleased to be in debates alongside him. And the Honourable Member for Boston and Skegness, I felt made a, an extremely well-informed speech, um, particularly about some of the difficulties faced with coming forward um, and the difficulties that there are in terms of GP training and in terms of uh, primary care and the pathway through services that people have to face. So I'd like to thank everybody who has taken uh, part today. The Royal College of Psychiatrists in uh, Scotland have provided a briefing paper which uh, indicates that Scotland has seen striking improvements in the provision of specialist eating disorder services over the past decade. Uh, this includes specialist units in Aberdeen, uh, in, in West Lothian and beds in Glasgow. Services have been developed to provide alternatives to hospital admission and shorter admissions. 
um, and there are anorexia intensive treatment services in Lothian and Fife, day programmes in Aberdeen and specialist teams in Glasgow. Uh, in terms of training, there is a 2010 Eating Disorders Education and Training Scotland programme that was set up to bring training to professionals across Scotland and to train experts in uh, practice. But despite all of these uh, issues and uh, progression that has been made, we know that there is still so much more that actually has to be done. In terms of my own experience, I have to say uh, that I would agree with the majority of people who have spoken that it continues to be quite patchy. I would say it continues to be a postcode lottery right across the United Kingdom. Uh, I don't set Scotland out as being different or having uh, different difficulties in that regard. Um, but I do think that the governments across all of the United Kingdom are trying to grapple and to uh, progress with these issues. I would particularly say that in rural areas, I think it would be helpful if the Minister could uh, address service provision in rural areas, what that might look like, how people could access services in rural areas, because I know from my own experience that that can be a particular difficulty uh, for patients when they come forward, particularly from rural areas, to um, perhaps having to travel long distances to services, which isn't always perhaps helpful for family involvement. And we've heard that family therapy and family involvement can be extremely important in terms of prognosis. Uh, I'd also like to say a bit about um, CAMS services. The Scottish Government is uh, going to be putting counselling services in uh, every school as, as an objective. And I know that the UK Government is also looking at those issues through the work that I've been doing on the Health Select Committee. Um, however, I think it, it, it's very difficult um, because when young people have an eating disorder, it perhaps doesn't present initially as an eating disorder it might present as depression or anxiety or as another symptom and the eating disorder itself often uh, doesn't come to uh, the acknowledgement of the person who's suffering from the eating disorder or uh, the attention of those around them for some time later so i think it would be important that services in schools and, and those who are working with young people have appropriate training to uh, try to look behind the surface, try to uh, determine the symptoms of eating disorder and how they might present in different ways in young people so that people don't fall through the net so often. Uh, it can be difficult and misdiagnosis um, in the initial stages uh, can be quite common in terms of eating disorders because um, the individuals involved themselves, uh, one of the symptoms itself is denial. Uh, so perhaps the person themselves doesn't want to seek treatment or they present themselves in a way that suggests they have a different type of mental health difficulty uh, or in fact it's their family who wish, wish them to seek treatment and they themselves are very resistant. Now those are all the types of issues that are grappled with in relation to services. The care pathway itself needs therefore to be improved. Uh, Denial, I think, is extremely important when uh, honourable members are speaking about early intervention uh, because it's extremely difficult to intervene early when uh, often people themselves find it very, very difficult to face their own difficulties and to accept them as they are and to come forward for treatment. So often we are looking at presentations in primary care at, at GP level for other types of difficulties and GP training will have to be extremely sensitive um, and have more hours involved, I think, in, in relation to eating disorders and understanding of how they present in different forms. Some of the difficulties I experienced were uh, referring from primary through to specialist eating disorder services themselves, um, which then required to go through uh, community mental health services. So the, the person virtually had to go through three services to get to the service that they needed to be in. Um, and uh, by that point, you're talking months down the line because they've gone from primary care to a uh, community mental health team and only a referral from a community mental health team then uh, led to referral to the eating disorder service. But I would suggest that that's not 
actually necessary because uh, psychologists and psychiatrists working in primary care are perfectly capable of diagnosing eating disorder difficulties and referring straight on to specialist services. So I think that should be addressed. Also, weight restrictions, I think, is a particular issue for those with bulimia. Um, and uh, it's very, very difficult if services place weight restrictions and BMI is one of the key criteria um, because those with bulimia will fall through the net. So the quick ask for the Minister that services can be more flexible and accept referral through to specialist services from those in primary care. Uh, that there will be specialist training for a member in every CAMS team to pick up eating disorders in young people that he has a discussion with advertisers regarding unrealistic expectations of body image and their contribution to mental health, and that rural services are an issue that can be picked up. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. And like others, I thank the Honourable Member for Bath for securing this very important debate and for speaking so passionately earlier today. As we've heard from many colleagues this morning, eating disorders manifest in many different ways. There are mental illnesses that involve disordered eating behaviour, and the types include anorexia, binge eating disorder, bulimia, purging disorder, and avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder, although this list is clearly not exhaustive. The severity and complexity of these should never be underestimated and commonly sufferers will go to extreme lengths to hide their symptoms and behaviours even from those closest to them. It is thought that the majority of people with eating disorders are young women aged 12 to 20 but it is harmful to stereotype and the possibility that someone can develop one should never be ruled out. The number of boys and young men developing them is rising and it is thought that it could be higher than we think mainly due to stigmatisation and fear of speaking out. Indeed, when I recently visited the Navigo Eating Disorder Service in Grimsby, which my honourable friend spoke about earlier, I met four service users, two whom were women over 40, and the third was a young man in his late teens. So again, I think that um, just shows that we, we mustn't stereotype. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rates among psychiatric disorders, with anorexia having the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder and of those surviving 50% recover whereas 30% improve and 20% remain chronically ill and it is estimated that 40% of people suffering will also self-harm. Given, given these startling statistics it is clear that more needs to be done to help sufferers with their recovery and that access to treatments must be greatly improved. Currently, someone with an eating disorder will wait an average of three and a half years before receiving treatment. And as we've heard this morning, this is worse for adults who statistically have to wait twice as long as children before seeking and accessing treatment. In 2015, clinical commissioning groups were given extra money to help children and adolescents suffering with eating disorders. And unfortunately, in the CCG's bid to balance the books in these times of severe NHS funding, much of this money has never actually found its way to the front line and of what did, very little was actually used for eating disorder services. And we've heard from a number of members this morning, the member for Bath, the member for East Kilbride, about how services are patchy, there does appear to be a postcode lottery and very, very disparate services available. Although we do recognise there's some fabulous work going on and once again I refer to the service that I visited run by Navigo in Grimsby. Much more needs to be done to raise awareness and to remove stigmas. Common misconceptions include that people with eating disorders are more responsible for their symptoms or that they would be more likely to use their disorder to gain attention than those suffering from other mental illnesses. These misconceptions must be dispelled and more awareness must be raised. The popular TV series Hollyoaks is currently running a story highlighting a young woman's struggle with her eating disorder and well-researched storylines such as this are an important way of educating people and dispelling the myths but there is still much work to be done and we heard a very passionate speech from my honourable friend the member for Eastline around the media and how that actually controls much of the narrative. I remember 
looking at women's magazines, I tend not to buy them so much anymore, but constantly seeing sort of, you know, frighteningly thin models. You rarely see plus size models in these magazines, even though, you know, being bigger, being bigger than a size 10 does not necessarily directly mean you are un unhealthy. And I think social media equally plays a very big part. And I think role models also have a responsibility. I remember a supermodel famously, famously saying, nothing tastes as good as thin feels. And of course, you know, particularly children and adolescents are looking up to these people. And it's very important that they recognise that they are role models in society. Data on access, quality, workforce and investment in adult eating disorders is not routinely collected and published. And this information is absolutely key to the evaluation of whether services are effective. And this would not be an acceptable measure for physical health conditions. So why is it acceptable for mental health conditions? And furthermore, we've also heard this morning that there are no waiting time targets in place for over 18s and it would be great if the Minister could respond to that. Now, in December 2017, the Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman published the findings after investigating the death of 19-year-old Avril Hart from anorexia. The investigation, ignoring the alarms, how NHS eating disorder services are failing patients, found that there had been inadequate court coordination and planning of Avril's care. Tragically, it was found that Avril's death could have been prevented had the NHS provided appropriate care and treatment. Now, recommendations by both BEAT, who I also want to thank, um, who do absolutely fabulous work, and it also in terms of lobbying us as members of Parliament to ensure this issue is firmly on the agenda, and the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman for the General Medical Council um, wish to conduct a review of training for all junior doctors on eating disorders to improve understanding of complex mental illnesses. And as we've heard this morning, um, although an estimated 1.25 million people in the UK are affected, training on this issue is limited to just a few hours amongst several years of training. And GPs are often the first port of call for people with eating disorders, and they must also be provided with the training that they need to identify the illness and know what steps to take next. And no blame can be attached to NHS staff, but the way the services run. The problems in the NHS have not come about overnight. They are problems that the government knew would happen. And junior doctors themselves have protested about this situation. And again, we've heard today that much more needs to be done to aid the early stages of diagnosing and treatment, treating eating disorders. As with anything else, early intervention is absolutely crucial. A constituent of mine who was suffering from an eating disorder was praised on her weight gain during a consultation. And comments like this are enough to set back recovery for months. So health professionals should be given training on acceptable basic language when dealing with sensitive issues such as this. And I'm very, very um, interested to explore more around the family therapy. So when I've met sufferers of eating disorders and indeed their families, it's clear that the impact on the whole family is absolutely great. So I think family therapy is a very, very positive way forward. Um, I'm conscious that my time is running short, so I'll try and um, sum up the remainder of, of my speech. Um, NICE guidance for eating disorders states that children and young people with suspected eating disorders um, should start treatment within four weeks. But a 2017 survey by BEAT found that only 14% are referred within four weeks of their first GP visit. The average wait for referral is more than 11 weeks and those aged 19 and over wait significantly longer. And the situation is worse for men and boys who make, make up between 10 and 20% of people with anorexia or bulimia. So mental health services, we know, um, it's been said before, are the poor relation of a cash-starved NHS. 40% of NHS mental health trusts are having budgets cut, and we appear to be moving further and further away from parity of esteem. And when I recently questioned the health minister, it emerged an average of 2,000 mental health staff are leaving their posts in the NHS every month. And at the end of June this year, one in 10 mental health posts were, were indeed vacant. And this is despite promises by the then Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, that he would increase, increase the mental health workforce by 21,000. 
As Labour's Shadow Mental Health Minister, I'm passionate about seeing improvements across all of our mental health services, as I know everyone is here today. I'm committed to delivering on our promise to have a counsellor in every high school, as early intervention is the key um, to preventing serious mental health issues. We would also ensure that budgets um, for mental health services are ring-fenced and um, we do ensure parity of esteem to provide a properly funded NHS with properly funded mental health services. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Sir Roger. And can I con start by congratulating the Honourable Member for Bath for securing this incredibly important debate on a topic which is a key priority for this government. It's also a key priority um, for the Minister, the Honourable Member for Thurrock, who unfortunately can't be here today. That's why I uh, am responding, Sir Roger, on her behalf. It's clear from the testimony we've heard today, having an eating disorder can be devastating, and the Honourable Lady is absolutely correct that people should have the correct mental health support in the right place, at the right time, and clearly, most importantly, without the fear of stigma. Um, eating disorders are serious, life-threatening conditions with the highest mortality rates of any mental health disorder. They can have severe psychological, physical, and social consequences, and they often start and are very prevalent uh, when people are young. And we know that early intervention is absolutely vital, as rightly noted by the Honourable Member for Dewsbury, and we recognise how important it is that everyone with an eating to disorder can access quick, specialist help when necessary. That's why we set up the first waiting times to improve access to eating disorder services for children and young people, so that by 2021, 95% of children with an eating disorder will receive treatment within a week for urgent cases and within four weeks for routine cases. Latest available waiting time figures for children and young people with an e eating disorder indicate that NHS England is on track to meet that standard by 2020-21, with the first quarter data showing 74.7% of all patients starting urgent treatment within one week and over 81% of patients starting routine treatment within four weeks. The number of people who are seeking treatment is rising, so it's greatly encouraging to see a commensurate increase in patients getting the care that they need, as well as a significant reduction in waiting times compared to last year. There is, however, further to go. BEAT, who have been referred to this morning, the Eating Disorder Charity, which does fantastic work in this area, reports that on average it takes people over a year to seek help after recognizing, first recognizing the symptoms of an eating disorder. And we recognize the importance of raising awareness and reducing stigma so more people feel able to talk about their eating disorder and seek treatment. And in January 2017, the Prime Minister committed to having mental health first aid training available to all secondary schools, aiming to have trained at least one teacher in every secondary school by 2020. Um, this the first two years of this programme has seen over 2,000 school staff receive training which is helping to reduce stigma in school environments. The Government has also committed to equip 1 million people to be better informed to look after their own mental health, so Public Health England is currently leading the development of a £15 million national mental health campaign called Every Mind Matters. The first pilot began earlier this month in the Midlands, ahead of a national launch next spring. If I can just move on to community services for children. Uh, inpatient treatment, wherever possible, should be seen as a last resort. That's why the government announced in 2014 and referenced uh, in many of the speeches this morning that we would invest £150 million to expand and improve eating disorder community-based care. We're making good on this promise and as a result 70 dedicated new um, or extended community services are now either open or in development thus far. This has led to swift access to effective eating disorder treatment in the community, with the number of children and young people accessing treatment increasing from 5,243 in 2016-17 to 6,867 in 2017. These services are designed to give young people with eating disorders and self-harm early access to services in their communities with properly trained expert teams that deliver evidence-based psychological and medical intervention. 
with the aim of avoiding the need for hospital stays. By improving this care in the community, we can improve outcomes and recovery, reduce rates of relapse or prevent eating disorders continuing into adulthood, and if admission is required, as a very last resort, reduce lengths of stay. So, but if I could now try and address at least some of the issues raised by honourable members who have spoken this morning. The honourable member for Bath made uh, a series of in incredibly important points, particularly around training for GPs. Um, uh, early identification is absolutely crucial. It's vital that professionals look out for the potential signs which indicate um, an eating disorder. GPs are trained to identify these symptoms and help patients discuss these issues. But in response to the recommendations in the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman report on the tragic death of Avril Hart, as referenced by the Honourable Member for Dewsbury, Health Education England is reviewing its current education and training offer and, crucially, identifying any gaps. They're working with eating disorder subject matter experts to scope existing evidence-based practice to inform any new education and training resources. She also was absolutely right to mention that being underweight and BMI is not a good criteria for treatment. Um, the NICE guidance is clear. Uh, rejection for treatment on the grounds of weight and BMI is not in line with any of the published guidance and should not occur. She also referenced uh, travelling too far for treatment, as did the Honourable Member for East Kilbride. We're absolutely committed to ensuring that everyone with an eating disorder has access to timely treatment as close to home as possible. That's why we are seeing a shift to community services to try and reduce, wherever possible, out-of-area placements. She talked about ring-fencing of uh, funding for these services. This is important as well. Local areas need to fund services based on local needs, and that's why I was alarmed to hear the figures from the Honourable Member for the City of York, and this is something I will ensure that I take up with our local CCG following this debate. And funding must, as the Honourable Member for Bath, reach frontline. Um, we already have in place the 70 community services uh, designed to give young people with eating disorders early access to services in their communities. The Honourable Member for Angus talked about uh, having the confidence to speak out. She's absolutely right, and we welcome Beat's work in um, helping to improve awareness. And I'm also delighted that the member for East Kilbride will be meeting with the member for Angus following her powerful speech. The Honourable Member for Ishloin uh, brought up an a, a, a awful constituent uh, case. I can assure the Honourable Member... Uh, that my officials have heard that this morning and with his permission we will follow up and make sure the department comes back to him on that particular case. The member for East Kilbride again mentioned service provision in rural areas and she was absolutely correct to do so. Um, several honourable members raised the issue of social media. The member for Boston and Skegness, Enfield and Southgate and uh, not least the Honourable Member for Strangford. It would be very unwise of me uh, to attempt to keep up with the Shannons, but I can uh, tell the Honourable Gentleman this Government does uh, recognise the impact that social media can have on mental health. Increasing evidence is showing that excessive social media use may have a detrimental effect on young people's mental health. The Honourable Members for East Kilbride and Enfield Southgate again also raised body image, as did the Honourable Member for St. Lewin and his incredibly powerful and moving speech. Um, I, I would just say those promoting the perfect body image should be forced to watch this debate and listen to some of the testimony we've heard this morning and, and think about what they publish and the impact it has and the devastating it, effect it can also have. To conclude, uh, Sir Roger, I'd like to extend my thanks again to the Honourable Member for Bath for securing this debate and all Honourable Members here today for their powerful, powerful speeches. I'm very proud of the work this government is doing to improve eating disorder services. We've got a long way to go. I'm incredibly proud also of those incredibly brave young people who've come here today to listen to this debate and who have been referenced in the speeches. I've also 
hope I've been able to provide some of the reassurance today that we are absolutely committed to reducing the stigma associated with all mental health con conditions, including eating disorders. Uh, Vera Hobhouse, you have one minute to wind up if you wish to do so. Thank you, sir, Roger. I want to thank everybody who is here today, particularly the amazing campaigners, Lorna Hope, the um, representatives from BEAT, who do an amazing work to help us all um, to break the silence and the, 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 the shame that sufferers feel around the issue. So there's clearly a lot that we can do as a society. Social media can help. Um, but there are clearly things that actually, um, the practical things that can be done um, where government and mental health services are responsible. And we've been talking about this, and I thank the minister for his response um, around um, waiting times, ring fencing of funding, um, proper training for doctors, but also sort of um, things like practical things, dump the scales. You, he, um, he said that uh, uh, there are actually nice guidelines, but then we need to make sure that these guidelines are actually being followed. Um, so um, the, sh the statistics are shocking. Um, if it is um, the, the highest um, suicide rate um, or mortality rate um, for um, uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, um, and a third of people don't get better. A third 